My endless fascination with lidded forms continues, and over the past few weeks, I've been scaling them up, creating larger versions of vessels I'd like to pair with smaller ones. It's been a busy few weeks, both in and outside the studio, and one of the more notable reasons for this is the addition of a new canine companion. Good boy. Can I say hello? Tiro, sit. Tiro, spin. Good boy. Tiro, pull. Good boy. Let's get back to the topic of this video, which is the throwing of the body and lid of a large cylindrical store jar. And I'll use this opportunity to talk about how I center and throw larger lumps of clay. Beyond just centering the lump with water, I start by patting it into shape and also firmly glide a finger from top to bottom. And this doesn't do much, but combined with tapping, it's a good way to roughly center the piece before any water even touches it. The first thing I do when centering is seal the base, which I do by squeezing with my little fingers right where the clay meets the metal wheel head and then run my hands up the lump of clay from bottom to top, squeezing in as I go to cone it. For much of the actual centering, I'm doing it from top to bottom. I squeeze very firmly either side of the lump and push my hands down the sides of the walls, and I let the excess push up in between them. And if you look at my fingertips, you can see just how firmly they're squeezing in, as are the palms of my hands, the rest of my fingers, and even the balls of my thumbs. I'll repeat this process of coning it up like so and then pushing it down on the outside a number of times until the piece of clay feels like it's spinning more evenly beneath my hands. Ultimately, I don't mind if it's not truly centered at this point. Of course, I don't want it to be off drastically, but once the lump has been opened up and the rough walls have been shaped, it can be quite easy to center the walls at that point. After I feel like the lump has been coned enough, I'll begin to push it down and form the shape I want so it can be opened up. I want a sort of fat disc with a flattish top. Sometimes when you're centering the clay, you'll feel an air pocket under your hands. And if I'm able to locate one at this stage, I'll take a potter's needle and I'll poke it a few times. We should let the air out and then I'll continue throwing as normal. And here's the rough shape I want to begin with. It's spinning nice and evenly and has a flat top ready for me to push my fingers in to form the hollow. For larger lumps, I use my thumbs to create the initial hole. This is something I do with larger pieces of clay, as there's enough material for me to really grasp onto on the outside with the rest of my hands. Then, once I've made the initial opening, I'll switch to using the index finger of my right hand and the pads of my fingers of my left hand, which I push all together, which I push into the side of the opening, and then I pull the form open to the right, pushing all my digits in the same direction and gliding them horizontally across the base. If I feel any friction whatsoever during this process, I'll immediately reach my right hand to scoop up some more water, as it can be incredibly easy at this stage for the hollowed out lump to be knocked off centre. There are still some things I need to do to this shape though, before I can begin pulling up the walls. I begin by placing two hands on the outside, and then I firmly collar the walls inward, so they're more vertical facing, as previously they were overhanging somewhat. When you're making pots, you want the walls to be facing in the direction they're going to be pulled. My first actual pull won't move much material. The walls at this point are so thick, and if I try to pinch them really firmly and move a lot of material straight away, there's a very good chance that things could go wrong. There are, of course, some potters who can do this, but typically, I don't throw many big pots. I'm still learning with each one, and I really try not to rush the process in the same way I might rush making some mugs. After I've thinned the walls out somewhat, I'll collar them so they slope inward slightly. I do this because as the lump of clay is pulled up further, it'll have the natural inclination to splay outwards as it follows centrifugal force. So if you are making cylinders, keeping them collared in between pulls will help you keep control of the shape of the pot. I can now begin pulling the clay up properly, which I do with a wetted sponge on the outside that my fingertips are pushing through, and on the inside they're met by the pads of my fingers. They squeeze together at the bottom where the clay is thickest, and then they move up together, pinched with the same thickness between them the whole way up. Once the pull's complete, I'll collar the shape in again, and I can also compress the rim at this point, which I do by sliding my index finger over the rim and pushing down. It's at this point as well that I'll deposit more slip onto the walls, as well as dousing them with water, as I need my hand inside and the hand outside to stay hydrated with each pull, as otherwise, if the wall on the outside dries out too much, 
or on the inside too, my fingertips could end up sticking to that portion of dry clay, causing the walls to catch and twist and draw the whole pot off centre, inducing an undulation into the vessel, which I really don't want. In many ways, the process of pulling up the walls is all about constants. There's a constant pressure that's applied through my fingers as they travel from bottom to top. They also move at a constant pace from the moment they squeeze at the bottom and begin pulling the clay upward. I don't stop and start or move them around sporadically or suddenly stop and squeeze in one place for too long. Instead, they just squeeze together and then just gradually and constantly move up together. If you do end up moving sporadically, or say you linger in one spot for too long, you run the risk of making a thin point in the walls, and if that's done too low down on the pot, the weight of the walls above it is enough to cause the pot to collapse. Together with my hands moving at a constant rate, the speed of the wheel also doesn't change dramatically throughout this process. It may speed up or slow down ever so slightly, but I'll never drastically change the speed, as long as my hands are engaged in a pulling up. And I suppose the final constant is one I've mentioned already, which is the use of water and slip that must cover the walls both inside and out, as the clay can glide through your fingers as you coax it upwards. So in between every pull, I make sure the walls are well lubricated, and I also soak the sponge which I'm using on the outside, which provides hydration on the outside for the entire time I'm pulling. You'll see more experienced potters moving more clay around at once. Sometimes the large pots they make look as if they'll collapse at any second as they're pulling up the walls. And I suppose, like anything, it just takes practice. I've thrown tens of thousands of smaller pots in my lifetime, and comparatively I've probably thrown less than 1% of that as larger pots. The skills are transferable to some degree, but without dedicated practice, there's a limit you'll hit quite quickly. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the last few weeks making some bigger pots. They've certainly been a challenge at times, and I've had a few warp and a few crack and a few break, as expected. It's a strange skill to teach yourself really, especially at this stage, when my left arm is placed vertically into the bottom of the pod. They're having to grip a very soft, sticky substance and move it upwards in space, in a vertical line, without any supports for your arms other than your body itself. And both your hands and arms, and even shoulders, need to be kept very stable and steady as they squeeze together and make a line in space. And there's a focus I find when throwing larger pots, which I don't quite have when I make smaller pieces which I've made thousands of times before. I suppose I'm more invested, and I'm also more cautious too. Sometimes when I'm throwing mugs, I'll move the clay around really rapidly, or I won't even bother to centre the clay 100%, as I know I'll easily be able to deal with any issues that arise. And even if the mug is ruined, it'll only take me another minute to throw another one, compared to say the 15 minutes it takes to wedge up the clay and throw this piece. This is the last pull for this pot, and at this point I'm not trying to drastically increase the height, instead I'm just making sure the walls are even and that the shape of the pot is more or less there, which thankfully for these pots is just a straight cylinder, the rims of which are the only part which are altered, which you'll see once I've cleaned off the outside of the pot, which is what comes next. I begin by using a sponge to remove any excess water from the inside of the pot, and I'm very careful not to touch the sides of the walls as I lower my arm in and out. If I were to leave this water inside, it would either eat through the base of the pot overnight, or it would eventually evaporate and be absorbed by the clay, but in doing so it might cause the base to dry out far more slowly than the rest of the vessel, which it's prone to doing anyway, as the walls and the base are typically a bit thicker towards the bottom of any pot, especially larger vessels. I then use a blunted old trimming tool to remove the excess clay around the base, and then I'll move on to tidying up the walls. For this, I use a sharp metal kidney, which I slowly glide up the walls, removing the outer layer of slip. After a certain point, I'll reach my hand inside and I'll push the clay out against the metal edge, rather than dig the metal tool in with unnecessary force. And as the walls become less supported, the higher up they go. This must be done, otherwise they could just be deformed. In this case, I also switch to another metal kidney, which has a much sharper edge, just to try and clean off the outside walls as best I can. I then set my throwing gauges pointer. This way I can throw a number of these to the same height and width after this one. The rims of my store jars are indented, like so. I wet the top and then I use my index finger and nail to literally push in the rim, creating quite a sharp right angle and a gallery into which my lid will slot into. As I push the indentation inwards horizontally, 
I keep one finger on top that pushes down vertically, which contains it and stifles any undulation that might occur. Then, as this procedure often alters the shape of the pot, I'll do some finessing on the outside form, pushing out this inward corner at the top against the flat metal edge. I'll then use a more robust kidney to remove this slip on these two facets at the top, and if you look at my hands you'll notice how I brace the two together to stabilise my movements. I clean up both the horizontal portion and the vertical portion, and then I'll use chamois leather just to smooth over the rim on the top. As I'll have to make a lid that can slot inside this, I then use a pair of calipers to measure this internal diameter, and at this stage the thrown piece is now finished. I'll now wire it through and carefully lift it away with my hands, making sure that I lift with my hands clasped around the bottom, close to where the base is, as that spans the gap between the walls and can withstand being held in such a way. I then take my measured pair of calipers and I invert them. I also add about a millimetre or two, which means I'll have a little bit of extra material to work with when I trim the lids down to shape in order to fit the jar. The lids themselves are a much easier piece to throw, and they're also made in a fraction of the time. I'm using very soft clay for these, as because they have no vertical height, they don't benefit from some level of firmness, which can be useful when throwing taller or more complicated shapes. For these, all I need is a flat disc, which I'll then separate into various parts, including the horizontal flange, which will rest on top of the pot, and the vertical flange, which will be the part that slots inside the jar section. Once I'm happy with the diameter of the clay, I'll open it up and create a shallow well. I'll then drag this outward slightly, and in doing so you can already see the beginnings of the two flange sections. I could spend a lot of time throwing these lids to be insanely accurate, so they barely need any trimming, but personally, I'd rather throw them relatively roughly, just so the flange is accurate, and later, once all the pieces are leather hard, I'll trim them all down to fit perfectly. After I've separated the rim, into the horizontal and vertical flange. I'll spend a moment adjusting it by eye until the diameter matches what I think the calipers will be, and then I check it properly before making any more adjustments, which in this instance there weren't many of. Then, just like finishing my bigger pots, I'll remove any excess water from inside the well and clean up the excess slip that covers the remaining surfaces. This style of lid is one I've sort of made synonymous with myself. As with making pots themselves, there are many different styles of lids you can decide to make. Some are more functional than others. These ones tend to be a little bit heavy, but that weight does mean they sit atop the vessel quite securely. They're quite monolithic in nature, and the lids themselves become quite pronounced features on the pots, as opposed to being the type of lid that settles into an internal gallery. Unfortunately, I forgot to film the process of trimming the jar and lid to fit each other, but I do have many other videos in my library here on YouTube that show how I assemble such pieces, and I'll link to a few of them down in the description below. I make sure there's a nice dry patch around the base of the lid, and then I wire it off. Then with dry hands I clasp around this region and carefully lift it away. They aren't giant pots by any means, but hopefully they'll match nicely with their smaller counterparts I've thrown. I did however film the trimming process vertically for Instagram, so if you would like to see that, together with many more photographs and videos of what I'm up to, I recommend following there too. But here are just a few more of the other shapes I've been making, and now turned I'll leave them beneath plastic for a couple of days so they can dry out really slowly. Anyhow, that's all for this week, thanks so much for watching. And I'll see you next time.